Let's get to the Bible. We don't, we don't have that much time to talk about the, the, the grandeur. We have, have no time to talk about, uh, about the grandeur of Solomon. That's what we are about to do. Get your Bibles out because we're going to spend a lot of time looking at the text. And uh, because David has already covered a lot of the things about the, the life of Solomon. But one of the things, uh, a couple of things that Solomon did, he wrote, you know, uh, he wrote Proverbs, he wrote Song of Solomon, he wrote Ecclesiastes. He wrote, uh, you know, three of, the, three of the Old Testament books. And the very name, name of them says a lot about the very, na- the very nature of them. We don't have all of the Proverbs that are given. I think the text, I don't know if there's a question on the card or not that said how many Proverbs did Solomon have? Well, over a thousand. And so it's not just the, the truths that you and I have in the book of Proverbs, 31 chapters, but you and I need to understand, he had, he had a thousand, was it 3,000, David? Was it, well, I believe it was 3,000 uh, Proverbs that he had. And so what we want to do tonight is to talk about the grandeur of Solomon. And Solomon is an unbelievable, important character in, uh, in, 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 the, in the story of the Bible. We're not going to spend any time reviewing it, but with the death of Solomon, you reach a other historical break in the Bible. You can talk about that, that period of time before the flood as one, one evidence, and then that period of time that, uh, of the flood and the period of the time after the flood and when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived. Then you talk about the sojourning down in the land of Egypt and the exodus and the entering into the promised land. And all of those are historical events. And each of them, you've got, if, if you'll learn them and put them like building blocks, you'll be able to understand the story of the Bible. And it becomes the skeleton on which you hang all of the truths of the Bible. They get to the promised land, they're ruled by judges. There's a book of the Bible called Judges. And then after that, they're ruled by kings. And that's where we are. We're at the, at the end of, a, of the time of kings when the kingdom of the Jews was a united kingdom made up of 12 tribes. What we're, where we're going to head with the next card is when Solomon dies, something tragic happens. The kingdom is divided and 80% of the Jews turn away from following after the house of David and there's a rebellion by, by the vast majority of that Jewish nation. But that's next week's lesson. So we want to try to end up with this matter of Solomon. Open up your Bibles to 1 um, to, uh, uh, First, First Kings. Look in chapter 4. We're going to talk about the grandeur of Solomon. Look in verse 21 of 1 Kings chapter 4. And this is an important verse. You need to be aware of this. So Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the borders of Egypt. What was the extent of Solomon's kingdom? The river, what river is that? When the Bible talks about the river, what river is that? It was Euphrates, all the way from, uh, you know, from uh, all the way up to the uh, Euphrates, all the way up to, to modern Iraq, and all the way down through uh, uh, Syria and Lebanon and the parts of the world that, that, that we know, and then down into the land of Canaan, and then all the way down to the borders of Egypt. That's what God had promised Abraham would happen. You remember the three promises God made to Abraham? That's why these things are so important. If we had time, I I was going to look at 15 verses of the land promise. You can't look at it. You don't have time to look at it. But God told Abraham, you are going to have the land all the way from the river Euphrates, all the way down to what is described there as the river of Egypt. That's not the Nile River. That's another river that's, uh, that, is, that is in, uh, uh, in, in, in um, about halfway from Egypt up to the promised land. But this verse says all the way down to the borders of Egypt. Solomon reigned over all of that land. God made the threefold promise. He said to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, I will make what? I'll make of you a great nation. That's who... That's the, that's the nation that gives us the 39 books of the Old Testament. How do we have the Old Testament? God made a nation and gave them the 39 books of the Old Testament, the Jewish nation. He said, I'll make of you a great nation, then I will put you where? In a great land. And that's what is talked about here in chapter 4, verse 21. 
that even specifically mentions the boundaries that are even greater than what God had promised back to Abraham in the book of Genesis. And the third promise, a great nation and a great land, and I will send what? A great, a great Savior. <coughs> and in the, in the text, it is, it is, I will, in, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so now Solomon is there. And look at the grandeur of Solomon. That's verse 21. He reigned over all the kingdoms from the river of the land of the Philistine as far as the borders of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. What would have been like to have lived in Solomon's house? Solomon's provision, verse 22, for one day was 30 cores of fine flour. How much is a core? Five bushels. Well, when those who are older know what a bushel of apples looks like and everything, think of a laundry basket. A laundry basket about this size and about this deep. And, and, and there, were, there were five, uh, there, how many is that? There were, th there were 30 times five. This big. Five gallons, ten gallons, I mean a bushel. You've got to understand, that's just for the bread. How much bread could you make out of, you know, 30, or pardon me, uh, out of, uh, I'll get my numbers right, uh, um, uh, out of 150 uh, bushels of wheat. That's amazing, isn't it? You've got to understand this. And then he says, that was for one day. And a lesser grain, probably barley, not wheat, but of some lesser grain. And, the, and there, were, there were 30 cores of flour and 60 cores of meal. You ready for, for the main course? One day's provision. 10 fatted oxen, 20 oxen from the pastures, organic oxen, and, uh, and 100 sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fatted fowls. He had dominion over all of the regions. And all of that is given in verse 24 and verse 25. And 20, verse 25 says, and Judah and Israel dwelt in safety. Solomon, how big is your grandeur? Well, let's see, he's got a stable out here. Look in verse 26. He has, he has a stable. How many horses did Solomon have? Can you see that in the text? He had 40,000 stables of horses. How many bales of hay is that in a day's time? I mean, can, can you begin to understand the grandeur of Solomon? And you begin looking at this, and all of a sudden that verse in Matthew, just, it just absolutely explodes to you. And, and, and he had 40,000 stalls for horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen, those men who were dressed in their fine array, riding on the stallions of the, of the kingdom. And then the Bible says, And these governors, each man in his month, provided food for King Solomon and for all who came to Solomon's table, there was no lack of any supply. They brought barley, they brought straw for the proper, to the proper place for the horses and steeds, each man according to his church. By the way, archaeologists have found these stables. It's not just some imaginary kind of thing. Archaeologists have found these stables. So God gave Solomon great wisdom. Verse 30, his wisdom was exceeded the wisdom of all of the men and their specific. He was wiser than all men. That's in verse 31. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. Bigger songbook than we've got. Solomon wrote them every one. Isn't that amazing? There's the wisdom that he's had. And then he talks about in these, he spoke of the trees from the cedars of, of Lebanon. Uh-oh. Let's talk about those cedars of Lebanon. You know where Lebanon is? You look at the promised land and you go up to the Golan Heights, way up on the northern boundary of Palestine. And that, the Golan Heights are part of that range of, mount, of mountains there, you know, 
and, and they're the Lebanon mountains. They're thousands of feet high. Now then, they were, on, they were the cedars of Lebanon. And so when Solomon is ready in the next chapter to build the temple of God, he talks to Hiram and he says to King Hiram, I need cedars to build the temple of God. Hiram sends word to Solomon in verse 8, I have considered the message which you sent to me, and I will do all you desire concerning the cedars and the cypress logs. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon to the Mediterranean Sea. Got a picture? When they cut these massively huge cedars of Lebanon, they will bring them down to the Mediterranean Sea, and I will float them in rafts by the sea to the place which you indicate to me, and will have them broken apart. Then you can take them away, and you shall fulfill my desire by giving the food for my servants. That's what Solomon offered him. How far is that? Can you imagine enough cedars, massively huge trees? Think not of redwoods per se, but I mean the cedars of Lebanon were renowned. Beautiful smelling cedar, you know, the smell of cedar chest in times past and everything. And so he takes them. Let's, let's, uh, the mountains are nearly 10,000. I don't know where they got them. Let's go up 5,000 feet and bring those logs down 5,000 feet in elevation down to the seacoast. Makes rafts out of them and floats them for 150 miles at least down the Mediterranean coast, down to where Jerusalem was. And then they were on the coast there and then they had to transport them from the coast back up to the mountains of Jerusalem, you know, two or 3,000 feet in, in elevation. Amazing project, isn't it? So Solomon builds this temple. The Bible describes this temple, over, that's over in chapter 6, and we will, not, we will not look at all of this other than one of the questions on the card is, uh, uh, what, what, what was uh, overlaid, in, what was overlaid with gold? Or you know, all of the furnishings of the temple were overlaid with what? Overlaid with gold. Wonder where you'd get that much, where you'd get where 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 you would where you would get uh, that much gold. Well, the Bible talks about and gives us the evidence and tells us exactly how much gold Solomon got every year. Got your cell phone? We're well, gonna be able to do this. But I just have to stop when I stop, and I can't tell you all about the grandeur of Solomon. Everything was overlaid in gold. The provision for gold. In Solomon, the amount of gold he received was 666 talents. Got your cell phone? Uh, uh, let's do some math, okay? You need to understand that the amount of 666 talents of gold is 25 tons. How much is gold worth? $1,700 an ounce. Get your phone out, multiply, multiply 1,700 by 16. That'll give you how much a pound of gold is worth. Now then, multiply that number by 2,000. That's the word of a ton of gold. Multiply that number by 25, for he received every year 25 tons of gold. Is your calculator big enough or did it start giving you <laughs> obscure numbers? Who's, who's got the, uh, you, what'd you get, Diane? Did you do it or you tried to do it on, on paper? Anybody got, got the numbers? Anybody do that? One billion three hundred and sixty million dollars worth of gold every year. Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one flower. You think about the provision that he had and the evidence that he had. Now he builds the temple. A hundred and fifty-three 
thousand workers spend seven years building that temple. And when the temple is built, they bring the, in, in chapter 8, they bring the Ark of the Covenant into that temple. And there Solomon consecrates the temple. And the Bible says that when he consecrated the temple, that a pillar of fire came down from heaven and the pillar of cloud came down from heaven. That's one of the questions on the card that came down and came to that very temple as evidence of the fact that there was God in the presence. In fact, the, the situation was so dense that the priest could not even get back inside the temple. So Solomon, on that day, offers sacrifices. I want to show you how, what, how the Bible describes. Look in chapter 8. The king, in, in verse 62, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 62, the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Sol Solomon offered peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord. How many bulls? How many, how many, how many bulls do they have down at Publix? How many bulls do they have? I want you to imagine where that meat is hanging up. I want to imagine the carcasses of 22,000 bulls sacrificed. And then he says, then he offered sheep. How many sheep? 120,000 sheep were offered. When I try to imagine the magnitude of all of this, my mind just cannot begin to grasp it. 20 plus tons of gold became his. He had ships that went down. You know how the Red Sea has that little triangle where Mount Sinai is? I don't have a map to put on the screen. But if you think about the Red Sea and where the Suez Canal is and the other is, is, the, is the northern tip, it's the eastern part of the Red Sea. And so they put, Solomon built a seaport there. And they left from that port and went down into the Indian Ocean and went all the way over to India. It was a three-year journey. And every year, brought, every third year brought back provisions of all of the grandeurs that were there. And the Bible mentions some of the very animals that he brought back. If you, want to, if you want to understand the wisdom of Solomon, just read chapters 4 through chapter 6, through chapters 8, and, and the evidence there is absolutely overwhelming. The height of Judaism as far as a world power was with Solomon. David wanted to build the temple. Who gave him the plans? You remember God gave Moses the plans for that tent in, uh, in the latter part of the book of Exodus? David, God was given by, uh, God gave to David the plans for the building of that temple. And David wanted to build that temple. In fact, he asked Nathan the prophet, shall I build it? And Nathan says, go ahead and build it. But before Nathan got outside of the palace, God says, you get back in there and tell him, no, you cannot build it. David was not allowed to build the temple. Why was he not allowed to build the temple? He was a man of war, right? He'd shed blood. Thank you, Eva. He'd shed blood. And God did not want a man of war to build that temple. And so he built, he had David, David's son was given the name, if I say shalom, does that sound like a Hebrew word? Peace. The very name Solomon had was peace. 
and Solomon prospered in all that he did. And when the queen of the south came, he walked away saying, the high has not yet been told. I wish we had more time. There's another whole aspect of this we could develop, but we've only got three minutes left. We'll tell you a story. I remember as a, in my teen years, older teen years, I was preaching at a little country church in Tennessee, you know, in, uh, uh, in Frida Artem or Lipscomb, one of the Christian schools, and driving down to Mooresville, Tennessee to preach. And I was teaching the teens, I had a little congregation, by the way, had about 100 members and had 30-something teens in it. You, you, I want you to hear what I just said, 100 members and 30 teens. I mean, every teen in the community was a, came, came to the church there. Fabulous work, and I guess I was pretty good with teens then. I don't feel like I am now, but I mean, it was a really great work that I was there. And so I was talking about the fact, why do you have to add to the Bible? I was really trying to drive home that, uh, that uh, you don't have to add to the Bible. And about that time, Hollywood came out with a movie called Solomon and Sheba. And I said to them, I said, can I illustrate what I'm talking about? And I told you everything we know about the queen of the, I already mentioned it. She, walked, she came all the way from Sheba, all the way to Jerusalem to behold the wisdom of Solomon. And she walked away saying, the half has never yet been told. And little smart aleck kids, I love little smart aleck kids as long as I can slap them. He raised his hand and he said, you know what this movie is? It's the other half that's not yet been told. <laughs> I never read this, uh, th read this verse without thinking his name was Joe Jones. I will never, I forgot him because I wanted to slap him. I couldn't, his mom and daddy, would, they were bigger than I am anyway. But uh, the half has not yet been told. Hey, that's true about Solomon, isn't it? And you've got to understand, he took them out of Egypt and brought them and put them in a land with flows with milk and honey. And if you want to see the grandeur of that land, right here, where do you get all of these animals every day, all of these wild animals? Where do you get all of these? The land was, was overwhelmingly blessed by God. Unlike what we see if you go over there to this world nowadays, the Lord said in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you don't live right, I'm going to curse the land. And it doesn't flow with milk and honey. Places that use some irrigation, it's really fruitful, but they don't have what they once had. But if you want to see the grandeur, if you want to see not just when the spies came back and said they're walled cities and brought back one cluster of grapes, when the Twelve spies went out. If you want to see the grandeur of it all, then read about Solomon and read about his house and about the house that he built for God and all of the provisions of all of the things that God gave to him. You end with Solomon. Grandeur stops. Solomon in the latter part of his life, and David taught this last week, left God. And because of that, the kingdom was split. The kingdom was divided. And that's where we're headed next time, next week in that study. Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like God arrays a one-day flower. And if God can do that, for a one-day flower, think about what he can do for us. And not just think about clothing, but how he can bless us, his children. Thank you so much. That's it. We'll go home.